part of the music education in that they should be listening to good music as much as possible, broadening their horizons, learning a bit about composers and whatnot. And so if you were going to do... And all that is foundational for learning some music theory as they get into adolescence. And so you've got several different elements happening all at once. You have the technical skill of learning to play an instrument, which gives you the experience of starting to learn to one, appreciate what on earth any technician is doing with the playing of an instrument mm -hmm. and respect that, as well as to start getting a feel for, oh, when I play these two notes on the piano, they sound pretty good. And if I play these two notes, wow, what on earth is going on? Right. That starts becoming an element that is recognized on a visceral level. You have listening to good music just as a background of a formation of taste, mm -hmm. you have the intentional listening to of specific pieces to then to start, analyze them. To start thinking more more analytically. And not necessarily analytically on the level of, you know, music theory of identifying the mode or the key, but just starting to say, how does it make you feel? What is the composer doing that's making you feel that way? Why does this make you feel happy or sad? You have some excellent podcasts. Oh, I and, do. That you can recommend in the show notes. Yes, I, I do have. We should probably start compiling a page on our website, mm -hmm. theowlry.co. We've got a great website where we outline what are we using, why, and how. Yes, we should do that. So once <laughs> you've listened to a few things just from this point of just listening and sitting with a musical piece, you know, start with something like Peter and the Wolf. Um, because it's very accessible. Or Young Person's Guide to the Orchestra. Yes. Benjamin Britten's always good for that. Mm -hmm. Those are great pieces for starting to identify things like leitmotifs and, yeah, I can see how that piece makes me think of a bird or a duck. And if you can get to a live performance of these by your local orchestra, do it. And then once you have all of those foundations, <laughs> then you can listen to something that starts explaining music theory and you have the, the foundation you need to start understanding the mathematics of what makes music work. Mm -hmm. And I've also got some, I've recently started listening to a, a YouTube channel called 8-Bit Music Theory that analyzes video game music of all things. But digging into the music theory that undergirds why good video game music has the effect it does on setting mood yes. and conveying ideas, as well as using video game music to uh, illustrate things like some of the uh, classical uh, modes. What's the one, the, 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 um, there's one that I know y'all have been talking about. Uh, I think, I think the host goes through movie music. Oh, that's, that's a podcast and that's okay, called, it's a podcast. that's called the soundtrack show. Okay. Um, and he uses movies and goes into both the history of the movie itself, sort of what was the production history, how the composer might have been tapped to do the work. Frequently, it'll go over multiple episodes as he digs into different elements. He's got several in Star Wars. He's, again, dug into a couple of um, video game soundtracks like Zelda and Mario. Right. And you learn a lot more about what undergirds those very s seemingly simple um, musical uh, motifs than is apparent on the on the surface level unless you have a very unusual child and you're coming to this new and you're trying to figure out what do we do how do we do this start there start with what's already familiar to the child you have a child who's mad for star wars start listening to these with them and discussing them if you have a kid who loves zelda or mario okay fine you can work with where the child is at i would not say you know start with a bunch of um you know, with some Chopin or some Liszt or, you know, Bach or Brahms. As much as I love those composers, I've got a friend uh, of mine whose husband grew up in a very classically music-oriented household and to this day hates anything from before about 1950. Um, so you don't, you don't want to create that kind of environment. You want to invite the child and yourself to kind of broaden your horizons, broaden your experience, 
and let it grow organically. Because if you start with, say, John Williams and Star Wars, you're going to inevitably let, be led to some of the composers that inspired him. Yes. And you'll you, get a lot of Rachmaninoff. You'll get a lot of Tchaikovsky. You'll Stravinsky. Get a, lot, a lot of Stravinsky. Um, and then they themselves were building on their predecessors. And you can you you really could build a music history course that starts with John Williams and goes back to um, Gregorian chant. And working and the working backwards can actually be beautiful, but you'll also end up with sort of strange elements where you'll um, sort of move, hop back and forth because a motif like the Diazire um, shows up in a ton of mu movie music. And which point you need to understand what is the Diazire? When was it used? How was it used? And so digging into that, you start hitting elements of history and all of it through the window of beauty. There is in fact a course, I don't know that we've actually watched it, but I know The Great Courses puts out, um, I think it's a Robert Greenberg mm -hmm. uh, presentation on history through music. We might even have I it. I think we own it. I don't think we've watched it yet. <laughs> but we have gone through one of his entire... Uh, we've gone through one of his... Some of you have. So, I never finished it. Sorry. So, myself and some of my children have gone through one of the Greenberg music courses. And they're fantastic. And again, you learn a lot of uh, music history along the way. You learn a, a good smattering of um, music Not theory. a paid endorsement. No. We just really like the stuff. Yeah. Our, our, our library of their courses is extensive and we've used a number of them. But there's a they're very good for self-instruction because one of the things that's a, a truism of education is you can't hand on what you haven't received. And rather than take that as a, well, I didn't have that kind of education, it's like, well, the good news is, is that you don't have Are to, you breathing? You can still acquire it. Yes, you don't have to go to a school to get it. You need to go to a school to have certification that you have it. And that's another key. With home education in particular, you don't have to know it in order to give it to your child as a teacher instructs the ignorant pupil. You can learn alongside your child and the two of you can, or more, in our case, we've got six, all of you can explore this together at a level that is appropriate to the given child. The conversations we have with our eight-year-old are very different from the conversations we have with our 19-year-old about these things, but we're still having them with everyone. Mm -hmm. And think, speaking of music, I was led to another idea, and this one is again, very practically oriented, but I think it's a good jumping off point, is that Charlotte Mason, I think is one of the best educators who expressed this idea of beauty as one of the elements at the heart it's of, essential at the heart of the education project yes. and it shows up in her approach to every subject as we would call it and quick bio charlotte mason was an early uh, late 19th early 20th century um uh english english educational theorist and practitioner she formed a girls school and educated young women uh she was a contemporary of maria montessori and um Oh, who's the other one? Can't recall at the moment. Wrote Peter Rabbit. Beatrix Potter. Beatrix Potter, thank you. So, Charlotte Mason had a number of elements of theory that she also put into practice. So she wasn't just, you know, sending these ideas off and like and speaking of them without experience. They were they she were She tested all of them in her school. And some of them were born of experience and then taught others how to establish similar ones, whether they were individual governesses or tutors, or also establishing institutional schools. And right. it can be done either way, although um, resources certainly are easier if you have yourself a full English manner. <laughs> with the staff to run it. Yes, but... That's actually a, 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 an occupational hazard of reading a lot of Charlotte Mason-inspired stuff. Yes. Is you're like, okay, I can only educate my children properly if we sell all we have, buy an English manor with staff, and move there, and then we just rusticate for 10 years. No, no, that wasn't what she was saying, and... While there's plenty of curriculum purveyors who claim to be Charlotte Mason and will leave you feeling that inadequate, really, the essence of what Charlotte is saying in her works about how best to educate a, a, a human person, male or female, is, is much, much simpler. It's simply put beauty at the heart of it. Build everything around exposing immersively to the true, the good, the beautiful. And true, the good, and the beautiful is actually very core because she's got her 
pro- principle of laying down the rails, mm-hmm. which is about moral formation, which is to say you cannot have an effective classroom if that classroom does not start with order. Yes. That one of your required elements as a teacher is to form the student morally, and that means teaching them right from wrong. That teaching to recognize good and go toward it, to recognize evil and avoid it. and that, Or fight it. Or fight it. And to have that as one of the elements. And so the student as being docile, which is to say teachable. Right. Um, Not necessarily subservient and meek. Right. To have that at one of the one of the pillars is that that laying down the rails so that they can run on them straight and true, and that's the heart of goodness. Well, because virtuous behavior, any behavior is habitual. If you are, you know, you you're either habituated to acting virtuously, acting appropriately to the situation, or you're habituated to not doing that, to to yeah, because, and you can't, acting viciously. Yes, and you can't function in a chaotic classroom. So order is the opposite, is the antithesis of chaos. Yes, but it's really worth stressing that she's talking about a large classroom with 20 to 30 pupils and a teacher and possibly a teacher's aide on a more institutional scale. And it's it's risky. I've run into mm-hmm. homeschooling parents who have done this. They read this business about order in Charlotte Mason and they decide that mean, they think it means their home has to have this kind of order. And that's wholly inappropriate in most cases. And this in the case is the order that is an aspect of beauty. It is the order that is having everything directed towards the same end and getting everyone on the same page. True. And so that's one of the aspects. That's that aspect of goodness. Truth is about choosing materials and pursuits that are ordered in in the real, yes. in things that are true. And be- Which is more than just factually correct. And beauty is about choosing that once you choose a book and the book is good and the book speaks truly about the nature of reality it also has to be beautiful yes and so whether it was the way she studied art when she added out what she called picture study and that would be not the you know the history of the artist or the technique of creating art yourself although those are both valuable and good parts of studying art but there is also studying a picture which is just spending time with a piece of artwork Mm -hmm. and starting with the surface level describing what you're seeing and moving from there to learning to speak about the picture to speak from memory about the things that you see about the things that strike you learning to see art and developing that learning to hear music because the way she dealt with music was the same You'd learn a little bit about the composer, but you'd also spend time just listening to the music. Mm -hmm. But I think with that even more than those aspects, the arts, so we'd speak, the way she would describe books, the choosing of literature was one of the most important aspects of beauty within her curriculum um, description. And it was the importance of avoiding twaddle. Yes. T-W-A-D-D-L-E. You can put a little card up. I, I probably can. But the reason why she did this is that the description of things that were of inferior artwork, of overly sentimental or simplistic language, not simple in the sense of you have a beginning reader and you want to have things that are at the appropriate level for that beginning reader. It should still be beautiful and true and good. Mm -hmm. And that even the most basic beginning readers should speak to something of truth and goodness and beauty. And a great example of, so what's a a beginning reader that does this? Frog and Toad are friends. Yeah, Arnold Lobel's Frog and Toad. Are are a perfect example of the kind of book, I mean, written long after Charlotte Mason, but she would recognize this as, these are good stories. They are stories that illustrate friendship rather than talk about friendship Mm -hmm. they are stories that are beautifully illustrated um beatrix potter's work beatrix potter's work is beautifully illustrated the the language is simple enough for a young reader but still has some beautiful turns of phrase um like the water was all slippy sloppy in the larder yes it's it sounds good to the ears you 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 have this 
visceral understanding of, of what, um, oh, who, what, which one was that? That was Jeremy Fisher. Yes, that was the tale of Jeremy Fisher. And, and you get the idea of, of his little house with the, with the water on the floor, and it, it creates this image that's, that invokes the senses. You can hear and mm-hmm. feel what it's like. That's good literature. And you know when you find a book at the library or the bookstore that doesn't fit this also. When you can look- Anything you get from a drive through window. No, I take that back. We have actually accidentally, serendipitously gotten some good stuff through through drive through windows. Chick-fil-A's drive through choices are often Well, they used to be. I don't know if they still are. The, the, the it's D- been a while since we've... The DK-style ones aren't as good. But a well, K- DK-style books generally aren't good, period. They're factoids. Which is problematic in its own way. Yes. But... When you find a book and you're reading through it and it either seems overly preachy Mm -hmm. um, or gross is the only way I can think of it, where it's like, I can understand why some people trying to appeal to a certain age group, I'd call it the 10 year old boy group, and you know exactly what I'm talking about, where they try to find the grossest, squishiest facts about some era to try to get people somehow interested in the Middle Ages, as if as if 10-year-old boys wouldn't be interested in the Middle Ages all on its own. Well, it, they aren't interested if you try and force them to consume stuff about daily life and the oppression of women and inequality in medieval society. You give them swords and battles and the song of Roland and Beowulf, and I have yet to meet a 10-year-old boy who doesn't go, dude, tell me more. Yes. But you give them all the shit that you find in the academic world and the obsessions that you find in school texts. And no, hell, even as an adult, I check out of that. Yes. I remember in high school trying to do an essay on uh, Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, and I couldn't find anything about the wife of Bath's Tale that wasn't feminist hermeneutics of the wife of Bath's Tale. I, had to go, I, I couldn't find the word hermeneutic in a dictionary. Now, here's the thing. There are excellent adaptations of the Canterbury Tales for children. Yes. I have, we, we've read them as evening story, And the kids were rolling on the floor laughing because you don't have to do anything to them. Right. You just have to make sure they're in modern English for them to understand them. And that's good enough. The stories stand on their own they do. as true and good and beautiful. Yes. And that's the at the, at the heart of, of choosing... You don't have to, you don't have to dumb it down. Correct. And what Charlotte Mason was fighting against was the dumbed down, the slipshod, the... Banal. The banal. Which is at the heart of modernity, what uh, Evelyn Waugh refers to as the age of Hooper in uh, Brideshead Revisited. But that that actually comes back to that point about education being educare, to lead out. You're trying to lead the child out of childhood and into an appropriate adulthood. And that's been lost for almost a century now with an industrial production model of refining raw material inputs, children, through a uniform process into finished product outputs, which are citizens who do nothing but consume and vote the way they're told to. And the an- the antidote to that... Is education. Is education. And so what we're trying, what we are all about, part of what led us to decide to do this is that there was that recognition of, there's lots of reasons to decide to start homeschooling. They can be matters of you moved to a new area and you're just not thrilled with the local schools. It could be that you have a concern about physical safety. You have a concern about moral safety. You have a concern about quality. Any number of reasons are why you decide to start homeschooling. Or even look into it. Or even look into it. But why you continue to do it is a different thing all of its own. And that's... And it really starts to shine as a lifestyle choice, to use the contemporary phrase. When you go beyond just homeschooling and you start, you embark on this education, this home education adventure, and 
following the way of beauty, recognizing the existence of and the importance of the way of beauty and okay, where do we go from here? How do we start? How do we dig in? I didn't receive this education. Can you help me? I've heard that from homeschooling friends of ours for, for 20 years now. Mm -hmm. It's like, I didn't get that when I was in school. I was a, I majored in, in biology. I majored in, you know, chiropractic. I majored in beer drinking and frisbee chucking. <laughs> like what most people living in our society today don't have this to hand on. Okay, great. We can help you acquire it and you can either do it alongside your child or you just have to stay one step ahead of them. And again, you know, you could really just play checkers or mancala with your child from the age of five to the age of 18 and they'd probably end up better educated than they will going through even the best uh, private schools with 30 or 40 or $50,000 a year tuition and all the rest. You have the opportunity with home education to do something that is so much more revolutionary and powerful and it, it really is right there and you just have to take that step. So we'd like to invite you to take that step. Please don't hesitate to contact us if you have any questions. Um, and uh, we will certainly be talking about this and related topics uh, even more in future episodes. So the usual YouTube wrap up, <laughs> be sure to like and subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> because they... share us with your friends share us with your enemies please if you find this outrageous share it with omg i can't believe they're saying these horrible things please share that and in the meantime all of our social media contacts as well as the website the allery.co um, can be found in the show notes and i will start compiling that list of awesome podcasts and websites and youtube channels and things resources so that, resources because there's there's so much you can draw on to help you start figuring this out. All right, I think that's it for this week. That wraps it up. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, criticisms, thoughts on the speed of a lightning bolt, please don't hesitate to reach out and ask. Uh, and if we can help you on your journey, uh, we, we can arrange that as well. Y'all take care of yourselves. Ciao, ciao.